I'm Tammy Dennett, ex-target a workplace bully turned communication coach. But it wasn't that long ago when I lacked the skills, the tools, and the knowledge to ditch the drama, confidently handle difficult conversations, and create better relationships. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you will see the business that I have today. One that is helping others just like you to find the confidence and peace knowing you can change your circumstances one conversation at a time. I created the Dissolve Workplace Conflict Summit to give you access to industry leaders who are sharing simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies so you can do the same. If you are an employee, supervisor, or an employer, and you are looking to access the top strategies to successfully dissolve conflict without damaging your relationships, then you, my friend, are in the right place. Today, I want to introduce you to Gail Tolstoy Miller. She is the CEO of Consult Networks and Career Networks, and she helps companies with their unconscious bias training, and she coaches people in their careers and business. Welcome, Gail. Thank you so much, Tammy, for having me today. I'm excited to have this conversation because, first of all, I think unconscious bias is something we don't really think about a lot. So why don't we just break it down at its fundamentals? What is unconscious bias and why is that so important today? Okay, so unconscious bias is based on brain science. And basically, we are bombarded with 11 million pieces of information at any given time. But we can only handle 16 to 40. So what that means is um, it creates shortcuts for us. And we need that because imagine if we were going to the supermarket, you know, you go to the supermarket, you just get there. You don't even think about it. You know how to go. We need that to get through our everyday everyday lives. Otherwise, our lives would be cumbersome. However, unconscious bias creeps in because, because of those shortcuts and all of our experiences, stereotypes, judgments come into play when we make decisions. And that's how unconscious bias happens. So for instance, our beliefs and the lens that we have, when we look at someone, we are already sizing them up based on our own lens. And sometimes that lens could you know, there could be microaggressions, there could be, you know, obviously bias. Um, Yeah, so that, that basically, that's how it happens. Now, did you find yourself in this work? um, Like, I'm curious how this is the work that you were called to serve in? What was, what was that motivating factor? You know, I think I actually was called to it at a very, very young age. Um, And then progressed when I was very young. Actually, I just feel like I was born shy. Um, very shy, and I was almost held back. They wanted to hold me back. Um, and my parents did not want me to stay back because I was so shy, did not speak. Um, but because of that, I was bullied, <laughs> which is, I know, the theme of your show. Um, immensely, immensely bullied. And um, I just knew that I was being bullied because I was different and I was an easy target. So from that, that kind of shaped my view on life of how people just perceive you based on certain characteristics and not really get to know you. Mm -hmm. And then as I progressed and got older, I started breaking out of my shell. I'm still always, I still, I'm like an introvert and I'm also shy at the same time still, but not as bad, obviously. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, But I kind of rebelled against that. And I'm like, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. So it was the complete opposite. And I became like this goth chick, (laughs) like in college, I I just like, and I didn't give a crap. And I was like, uh, kind of like anti-establishment, not anti-establishment, but I was questioning the norms Mm -hmm. of our society and how people are judged. So I studied sociology. I went to NYU in New York City. And I would see how people would judge me based on how I was, you know, how I looked. I mean, people would actually cross the street, but little do they know, I'm like, you know, going to college and, you know, trying to make something of myself. So uh, that kind of shaped my thoughts on unconscious bias. And um, I just thought that most of the decisions that we do make are very superficial. And I couldn't understand like, like, why is this happening? Why are they doing this? Why is corporate America like that? And I was digging really deep at a very, very young age. So that's kind of how it started. And then interestingly enough, um, when I graduated, I went into the music industry and then went into recruiting, which 
heck, you can't be more judgmental than recruiting. And I had rose, you know, colored glasses. I'm like, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to be the change, you know, this, I'm going to make a difference. And as you progress, yes, there are things that you can do to make a difference, but you realize that, well, at least I did. I started feeling like a sellout, that I was an accomplice to all this. I'm like, I can't take this anymore. This goes against everything that I am. I'm still this inner goth chick that will never go away, though I don't look like one anymore. Um, so that's when I really started to say, you know what? No, we got to stop this BS in corporate America. It's just, it's an, to me, corporate America is just an extension of high school. Mm-hmm. It's group think. It's fitting in, trying to fit in. Um, And I think companies are making poor decisions based on lack of diversity and, you know, unconscious bias. And yet unconscious bias is difficult because we don't know we're doing it. So there are practical things that companies can do to help alleviate that through process and policies and procedures. Yeah, that made me think about, you know, as you were saying, we make these really quick judgments, how, Mm -hmm. you know, only have three seconds to make a first impression, those kind of beliefs that are out there. And, you know, in some sense they're true, but how does the everyday person like myself or a leader in the workplace tap into that awareness or even just that acknowledge that I might be having an unconscious bias here? Like, what does that look like when you're working with somebody to help them navigate this problem? Yeah. So it takes a lot of work. And again, we all have unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Um, It's impossible. If anyone says you can be completely eradicate unconscious bias, they're lying to you. Okay. Even someone like me, who's very aware, it still creeps up. So there are certain quick things that you could do is slow down, slow down your thought process and start questioning, why am I making that decision? And when you become more aware of like, okay, why did I judge this person? What are my beliefs? And it all starts from when, usually when you're younger, right? And the particular experiences, how did this experience shape this outcome of how I'm viewing this situation or this person or these groups of people, right? The stereotypes. So it's a matter of taking a big pause and questioning yourself, but yet you could still confirm your beliefs too, right? So we'll give an example. The country's completely divided, right? 50, 50. I don't want to get into politics. This is not what it's about. Okay. I'm not going there. Okay. I appreciate that. Oh, I'm so not going there, but I do want to go there because I want to show to to this extent how you people have the same information, but yet 50% of the people view it one way and the other 50% view it the other way. And that's because it's based on their life experience and they may want to see it a different way, but they confirm their thoughts, right? Same thing with media. You're going to believe what you want to believe based on your own perceptions, stereotypes, and judgments. This sounds so, like it's really closely aligned with the term I use in confirmational bias. Yeah, that's it. There, there's all different types of biases. There's affinity bias. That's that's confirmation bias. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where maybe totally. I'm not aware that I have this unconscious, but I've, I'm purposefully picking things out in my environment that align with what I think my values and beliefs and, and desires are. Right. So then you perpetuate that. So a way to alleviate that is, is to kind of flip the thought that you had and extend your, your viewpoint and your world. So, you know, if you look at your inner circle, usually your inner circle is usually people that are just like you. I just mentioned affinity right? Affinity bias. We feel most comfortable with people like ourselves. So if you start branching out and um, trying to get to know different types of people, whether it be race, gender, um, nationality, religion, you know, it, it, it really runs the mm-hmm. gamut. Um, and you do that. And then you kind of flip like, what would I have to believe in order to think the opposite? Right? Mm-hmm. I also have a technique called, um, I don't know if you saw my TEDx talk, which is an unconscious bias in recruiting is, and this is my method, is the so what method. And what I was noticing is in recruiting, when hiring managers or recruiters were saying, well, 
we're not going to hire them because of this, or I like them because of this, or this matters. And I would say, so what? Why does this matter? And I think when we really start looking at why things matter, you realize that they really don't matter, Mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like the lies that we tell ourselves or the beliefs that we tell ourselves that matter, but they really don't. They have no impact. Does this person, especially in hiring, as far as um, let's say if there's, you know, they're a mom, right? We have, there's an unconscious bias with working moms, right? <laughs> as soon as you let's said say, mom, I'm thinking, yes, kids yeah. and external Kids, like, oh, they can't travel. Mm-hmm. Whoa, slow down here. So what? You don't know, like, that's not for you to decide. So that's another thing. Empathy is a huge, is, is another way having empathy for others. Because I think that's a big part of, Um, unconscious bias is not having the ability to, um, you know, it's impossible to be in someone else's shoes, but to kind of like understand um, that they are in those shoes and empathize with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are really important. So if we could just stop and summarize for a second, the first thing is to slow down and just take a moment and think about why am I making this judgment? And then the second thing is to flip the script, ask yourself what else could ask yourself what else you would need to think. Is that what it was? I'm sorry. Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then the third is, so what? Ask yourself, does this matter? What is this important to? Right. That's like three three bombs you just dropped on us, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just like three simple things. It Mm -hmm. seems simple, but it's not. And then also expanding um, your inner circle is is a good one too. Yes. I've heard that one too. Um, To help learn how others live is to just not always stick with the people that you seem to be I'm drawn to, but to also explore and to be asking people about their lives and their beliefs and their values. Right. I'll tell you what, in my own household, we got some divides on politics too, but. (laughs) Yeah. And look, everyone's holding tight onto their beliefs. It's very difficult. It's become our new religion politics and people are very, um, they're holding really tight. You know, I think, look, unconscious bias, if you think about it, really impacts all aspects of our society, the judicial system, media, education, even dating, parenting. I mean, it, it goes on and on. So um, yeah, it, it impacts all aspects of our lives. And oh, healthcare is a huge one. I mean, it could be a matter of life or death, you know, even COVID, you know, there's like mm-hmm. bias with COVID. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, bias just creeps up everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of our relationships in the workplace, we've got these three tips, four tips actually, on how we can start to move to understanding what unconscious biases we have and to start to uncover them. What would it like, what are the benefits of that? I mean, cause you know, everyone will say, well, I don't have time for this. I just need to get my work done. This doesn't matter, you know, hire the best person for the job or whatever it is. What is the benefit to the organization and to the individual right. in it? to really make this a priority in their relationship. Okay. So when it comes to hiring, unconscious bias doesn't mean not to hire the best person. It actually means to hire the best person because we are bombarded with so much, I hate to say it, BS. The beliefs that we have, like we're not going to hire this person because we don't like the way they look or we don't like their name or they live too far or we don't like their voice. Those things don't matter. So I actually think if we cut through the unconscious bias and become real, then um, we will hire better people and not just hiring people that make us feel good because they're more like us and make us feel comfortable. Again, the affinity bias, but from an organizational perspective, I mean, there's, it impacts all aspects of the organization. And the thing is it's unconscious. So we don't even know we're doing it. So Mm -hmm. it affects compensation. It affects who gets promoted. It affects who, um, gets assigned to like the great projects. It also impacts our relationships and how people feel like the microaggressions, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, It could be a manager as simple as, you know, they have, let's say three employees in their group. And it just happens to be that there's one person in the group that they're never giving eye contact to. Well, that person feels not that great. Like, why is it my manager not giving me eye contact or looking at everyone else, I feel left out. And this is a constant. The manager doesn't mean to do it, but there could be something underlying from an unconscious bias perspective. Same thing in meetings that happens all the time. 
you know, who gets called on, who has more of a voice, who's listened to. So um, there's many layers. And from a corporate perspective, yes, we could all try to do the things that I mentioned before. But if you just do that, you're going to fail. You need to have policies and procedures that are in place to help alleviate some of the inequities that are within the organization so it doesn't creep in um, your unconscious bias. If it does happen, it won't be um, as impactful. And the benefit is that when you have more diversity and more inclusion, you've got happier employees, you have higher retention, you're able to attract uh, better talent, and yes, your revenue will boost. So um, it's a win-win. I mean, it, there's no reason not to do it or try to um, help eradicate some of the unconscious bias that we have. Again, not going to be 100% because a lot of people, when we talk about unconscious bias, they get really annoyed. There's a big controversy now about all this diversity and inclusion and unconscious bias. And, you know, people think that unconscious bias doesn't exist. It's a bunch of, you know, just it's, but it's, it's in MRI studies, it's in science. So, um, but I think that we should try to do our best to be the best that we are and to make the best decision making that we mm -hmm. can. And I really do think it comes down to, again, focusing on what matters and our decision making and not being clouded by all of the nonsense that we carry with us and the preconceived yeah. notions and stereotypes that we have. Yeah. So it sounds like there's multiple layers to this. So there's the personal oh, yeah. responsibility and building that awareness and starting to question, well, is this my, like, they're so habitual, as you mentioned, unconscious, we don't put thought to it. And so really taking the time to question that piece. And there's an organizational layer with policies and procedures, almost like a fail safe, not quite a fail safe, but you know, a checkbox to say, is this influencing my decision here? And then I'm wondering if there's like a third element. I'm as you were speaking, it made me wonder about what about a debriefing? So you've just had an interaction and maybe someone has either said something or you're just curious, did did an unconscious bias influence the outcome of this? Is there a debriefing process that maybe you you work with people so they can help to uncover this? As far as oh, as far as uh trying to figure out what their biases are. Yeah. Oh yeah. I go through a whole exercise with them. It's, it takes a while. Um, I mean, there are some simple things that a person can do. Um, actually there is a test by Harvard, um, the IAT test, the implicit association test that you could take to test some of your biases, um, which is a good start. Mm -hmm. Um, there is some controversy with those tests. Some people say they're not valid, but right now those are, that's kind of like the gold, I wouldn't say the gold standard, but it's definitely a go-to just to get mm -hmm. started if you want to go like right now on your own. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's an exercise that I go through with my clients, um, really digging deep into their beliefs, their experiences, and then seeing how that manifests into their everyday lives and their judgments. Yeah, this, this sounds like important work um, and hard work you know, because there has to be a certain vulnerability for people to be open to learning this piece. Do you find that there's, well, you mentioned that there is some resistance in terms of the science, I suppose, but um, who would typically come to you? Is this, are organizations recommending their own people to you? Or is this something that an individual like myself would go, hey, I think I, I might have an unconscious bias and I'd like to uncover this more. Um, it's typically organizations. Um, that come to me, I do speaking engagements too, um, and I do the training, but I also incorporate unconscious bias in my career training. Because if you could break that and you know what the, your, uh, the unconscious bias would be, then I help them overcome that. And I kind of teach them the affinity aspects of, so like, for instance, Let's say one of my clients, she's looking for a job. She's over 50. I, we already know. I already know what the bias is Age. or if there's other, right. Um, so I already know that they think that you're outdated, that you may be overqualified. You're going to look for too much money. Um, you're stubborn. So what are some of those things that you can, you know, switch the script on that one and put yourself forward where they don't know that you're like, okay, well, I'm going to come in and like say, 
Well, I know you have this unconscious bias about me already the minute that you see me because you know I'm over 50. No, you're going to work it in very subtly. But um, and that helps alleviate any kind of unconscious bias that they may have. So and then finding the affinity um, and using that to your advantage. So trying to use unconscious bias to your advantage and not having it as something that is your baggage, basically. Right? That is extremely interesting. I mean, you're right. As soon as you said over 50, I was thinking um, she's going to have a hard time because there is this ceiling or this limitation in the workplace that people will think exactly what you had shared, you know, about them being outdated in skills or knowledge, or they're not fast right. enough. So I work in the healthcare industry and nursing and you know, we tend to think of retirement um, postings, as you would call them, because they're not as physically demanding anymore. And those kind of pieces that come with that. Exactly. So if you're over 50, you're going to have to go in with high energy. That's the big thing. It's, um, I noticed in recruiting for candidates over 50, the, the feedback that I would get is, oh, this person's low energy. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like it was code word for age discrimination. There's a lot of ageism. But if you go in there and you don't give them any reason to believe that you have no enthusiasm or you're not up to date on your skills, then, you know, it's going to be your job to go in there and convince them of that. So mm -hmm. fascinating. Is there anything else you want to add to our conversation about workplace and unconscious bias that maybe I didn't ask? Um. Not really. I mean, I just think that it's really important to just become more aware and see how it impacts your, you know, your life. And it really starts when we're young. I mean, you, if you think about teachers, you know, how um, teachers impact, and they're not going to like this. They don't like this when I say this. They're like, oh, I'm not biased. I'm not, I don't have unconscious bias. Uh, you're human. You have a pulse. You have unconscious bias. And there's studies on this. And how they interact with students, male versus female, um, and you know it's it's hard because again we all have it. it starts young and it's ingrained, and even the images that we see in media. Mm -hmm. So if you become more aware and you're like, ah, oh, you know, like why is it that we grew up and girls wear pink and boys wear blue, mm -hmm. right? women, you know, wear dresses or, well, now we can wear, you know, obviously more, but like men can't wear it. men. It's not really that accepted for men to wear dresses who created that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not, we didn't come out of the womb with that. That's all socially um, created. And then we have to think about why is that? Why do I feel that way? Right. So if you want to drill it down to your thoughts and your perceptions, you know, someone who's overweight, those, you know, preconceived notions. How do you feel about a particular race or a particular religion? And you really have to be honest with yourself. And usually it, it comes down to the things that were that you were told as a person by your parents or an experience. And you could break that cycle. You could totally mm -hmm. break that cycle. I'm wondering if a safe place to start would be at an edge, like where you already know that there's a, a dis dissonance between you and something, if that would be a safe place for people to go out, oh, this is a place to explore and begin that process of slowing down. Yes. Asking yourself, why does this matter? Pick the one the thing. Script. Yeah. And just yeah. Like really pick the one it. thing. Yeah. Pick the one. Look, we all know, like, I know what my bias is. I have a couple, um, and I'm sure I have more, but I, there's a couple that I'm so aware of and that's, those are the ones that you need to start working on. Mm -hmm. And you could say, is it unconscious or is it conscious? Right. But if you dig deep, you'll figure it out. You're going to, if you start questioning. Yeah. It's about bringing some it of the to the forefront. Yeah. So pick one that, that is, yeah, that's the best thing is to pick one or two and work on that. And then each time that you catch yourself say, Ooh, you know, yeah. um, and I do think that in the workplace, I think we need to have conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know your theme is being bullied. And I find that if you speak up and you question that person, if you, if you feel like you're a victim to someone and their unconscious bias, most of the time they would feel mortified. Like they don't want to do that. We all don't want to mm -hmm. 
we don't want someone to feel uncomfortable based on, on our own unconscious bias. So there's ways of approaching people um, or a person that if you feel that you're being victim to that, you could say something in a very nice way. It doesn't have to be confrontational, you know, just be like, hey, you know, I'm kind of feeling this way. And then that opens up the conversation. And yeah, most of the time the person's like, oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. And then you could say, oh, I noticed, you know, did I do something wrong? Or I wouldn't even say, I, I, did I do anything wrong? You don't want to be victim, but is there an issue? I just feel, you know, this, this, and this, or this is what happened in the meeting. Can you explain that to me? Um, yeah. So I think open communication is key. Mm-hmm. A safe communication where there's yeah. no, re- you know, retaliation type. Yeah, aspect. absolutely. Absolutely fundamental to, to exploring if there is a bias present or if it's just a bad day or something else, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight, and your knowledge. I love how you took your life and you just went from this introspected, shy girl, and then you kind of just put it all out there for display as a goth person. It's like <laughs> your own personal experiment to see what would it be like if people saw me. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because I almost felt like I didn't want people to see me. It, it's a weird it's hard yeah. to explain because you don't want to be like, it's like, all right, I'm just going to be me. I don't care what you think of me. And it's very similar. It, it felt very similar to being shy. Like, I don't want to be seen. Let me go. I'll be different. Not that I want to be different just to be different, but it just, so I almost didn't want to be seen. Just leave me alone. Don't judge me for what I look like. This is what I look like. It's no different than you putting on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. This mm-hmm. is what I'm wearing. And why does it matter? Why do you care? It doesn't affect you, but somehow you're scared of me. Yeah. You know, it's right? because in healthcare, it was tattoos. When tattoos were first becoming mainstream, um, I, as a teacher, we would be telling them they have to cover it up. They have to wear long sleeves because there's this image about tattoos and a negative connotation that you can't be a good nurse and have a tattoo at the same time. It's so ridiculous. Right? Yeah. I s- I suggest everyone, and it's very superficial. Most of the things that we worry about in, in corporate America is so superficial. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have not evolved from high school. It's just an extension. Um, I would say everyone should check out my TEDx talk, my unconscious bias TEDx talk, because I think it hits home for a lot of people from a recruiting perspective. And I touch upon the things, and I did this purposely, not the unconscious bias that's so obvious, like race and all that. I touch upon the things that happen, the little unconscious bias, and I don't want to give away too much, okay, but yeah, I don't. we'll save it for yeah. a surprise. <laughs> yeah. <It's really> slow. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, awesome. thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for much having... for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you for having me. Perfect.